So today we'll um, do a welcome with some updates. Uh, we have Bo McCready um, doing a presentation on um, his Iron Viz uh, submission and past uh, submissions and reflections on that. We'll have an attendance prize giveaway halfway through. Uh, must be present to win. Uh, then we'll have uh, Corinna Spitalnik um, presenting on asking better questions, which I think is a really valuable um, data skill. And then we'll do the wrap up and um, the, tell you about our next event coming up. So the Data Pride Tableau user group is a virtual community space uh, dedicated to highlighting, elevating, and bringing together the LGBTQ plus community in data and its allies. Um, we are a community within a community. Um, we are all about um, celebrating um, the LGBTQ plus community and um, bringing people together. And um, that's that's what it's all about. My name is Sarah Carr. My pronouns are she, her. Um, you can sometimes find me on Twitter and on LinkedIn and on Instagram. Um, I'm, uh, uh, I work uh, in the public sector and I'm a Tableau user group ambassador. And my co-lead, uh, he couldn't be here today, but it sends his best, is uh, Lawrence Durbin. Uh, and you can find him on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and he is a um, Tableau ambassador as well. Uh, there's really great things come up. Um, registration is now open for Tableau Conference. Um, it's going to be April 29th to May 1st, and it's in San Diego this year. Um, I believe early bird pricing um, is for registration costs is um, open now for a couple more weeks. Um, if you, uh, I would totally recommend going. Um, and if you have any questions about going, um, please reach out to um, the data community, reach out to Lawrence and me. Uh, he can give you the experience of an extrovert going. I can give you <laughs> the, the introvert uh, survival guide. Um, <laughs> but it's a really good experience. And you can scan the QR code to uh, learn more about it. So um, Tableau Public has a um, a lot of great resources, and it's a great um, space to um, practice your work and showcase your, your work. So if you're not on there yet, um, I totally encourage it. Um, you can download workbooks to see how they're made. Um, you can subscribe to Visit the Day to see what other people are doing. Um, even if you don't have Tableau Desktop, you can use um, Tableau web authoring to um, make. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, you can use Tableau web authoring to practice your skills, uh, bookmark visits that you're really interested in, and, um, and also uh, use it to elevate your, your, your work and um, the kind of spotlight like, hey, I'm, I'm interested in, in new opportunities with the hire me button. So they're always coming up with cool things um, and it's totally free and just a great um, space to practice your, your skills. Um, one great route to get started is um, the Data Plus Movies Initiative. It's a huge data set with IMDb data, the, the movies uh, database uh, data set. And uh, you can download the starter kit and starter dashboard. And um, once you sign up for a Tableau public account and um, and work with, get creative. Um, you can make it your own um, and um, then upload it, publish it to Tableau Public with Data Plus Movies in the description and um, share it with everyone and, and um, build your skills. Um, Kevin Wee and Jessica Moon in the pictures here, um, have great examples of um, their work with the, the movies data set. So um, check them out. 
All right. So our first presenter is um, Bo McCready. Um, he's out of um, Austin, Texas and a Tableau Public Ambassador. Um, when um, we were thinking about the February uh, meeting uh, topic, like February, Valentine's Day made me think of love. And uh, the Iron Biz submissions uh, had me covered because the, the theme for the entry submissions was was love. And um, there was a blog post highlighting a few, including Bose. And um, uh, uh, Viz was about his, um, his, his dad, him and his dad's relationship and um, the, uh, how, how it was affected and, and his, his journey with um, metastatic melanoma. And um, it was just really well done, really meaningful. And I wanted to bring it back to the group. Um, and um, I, I also appreciated um, that looking at um, several of Bo's visits of the day and, and things like that, um, the, like all the, the rainbows, there's some sports ball in there, which I kind of get, but, <laughs> but there's, um, a lot of, um, pride related, um, visits, which is just really great to see. And I, I wanted to bring that, uh, to the group and, and have him, um, share, uh, more about that, um, data storytelling. Um, so, um, thank you, uh, Bo for joining us and um you can uh take it away all right sounds good thank you sarah um i do have to apologize quickly i'm not seeing the sh there it is perfect sorry the the share screen option i was waiting for there but um cool all right so um I apologize. It wouldn't be a, a virtual presentation without a quick um, <laughs> a quick tech glitch here. I apologize, but give me just one second here. Um, all right, let me try this one more time. Okay, I apologize one more time. I'm gonna quit and rejoin the meeting very quickly. Uh, hopefully this will work with a quick restart. Well, while we're waiting, since my topic is about asking better questions, I'm gonna throw a question um, in the chat and we'll just start collecting some, some answers. Collecting some data. <laughs> collecting some data, yeah, I mean, it's a data thing. So um, when I ask people to introduce themselves as, you know, if I'm doing a workshop or presentation, I usually try to ask something easy that everybody can answer that's interesting. So a lot of people put where they're from, but I want you to give me you already have your name on there. Um, sort of your role, and then what is your current coffee order? Put that in chat. I'm gonna add it to role and current, or, or coffee shop order, sorry. I'm not a coffee person. Bo, we can see your screen. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much yeah. for, for covering with an icebreaker question too. I, I apologize, but hopefully hopefully we're, we're good to go now. Um, Cool. All right. Beautiful. I'll I'll answer the question in the in in the spirit of uh, of of ice breaking too. Uh, so I live in Austin, Texas. There's a local coffee chain here called uh, Summer Moon Coffee. It tends to be our go-to. It's on the way to uh, school for uh, when I when I drop my daughters off in the morning. Um, and they do uh, they do a drink called a 
Well, they do like a summer moon latte. I do the quarter moon that is a quarter as sweet as the regular one. But that is, uh, that's my go-to. <laughs> um, I cool. like those naming conventions though. That's cool. Yep. Quarter, I would love to walk in and say, can I have a quarter moon? That's yep. just cool. <laughs> They're ready. They're ready for you. Yeah, another summer moon fan. Good. Um, cool. All right. So um, again, yeah. Thank you so much. I apologize again for the for the technical issue, but it looks like uh, looks like we're we're up and running here. So um, I'm gonna do my best to keep an eye on the on the chat window a little bit as we go to, um, but. Um, I just want to say before I get started, um, you know, we don't have a, a huge group today, so I'm, you know, I'm super happy to do kind of informal presentations. Like, please feel free to raise your hand, jump in, ask a question. Um, anything you want to do as I'm going here, uh, I promise it will not bother me. Um, this is uh, this is also my my first time delivering. Um, this content in particular. So um, it's a yeah, new new project, new thing to talk about. And um, also, um, you know, one that can be a, a little bit emotionally challenging too. So um, thank you for, uh, for joining me on this uh, journey and giving me a chance to talk about it. So uh, before I get into the, the the project itself and kind of the, the meat of the presentation, um, just thought I'd give kind of a quick background on on who I am and and what brought me to be uh, uh, speaking to this group here. So um, I would say that I had kind of an unconventional pathway to get into doing this kind of work, but as I meet more and more wonderful people in this community, um, there are so many unconventional pathways that I feel like um, it's just kind of what what unusual path did you did you take to get here? Um, so uh, I studied at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, I did my bachelor's in history um, and looking at the uh, job market at the time with uh, that degree and uh, how everything looked, um, it felt like the right choice to go uh, straight into grad school at that point. So um, so I went into the School of Public Affairs. I got my master's in uh, public policy. Uh, and then after that, uh, I moved into the School of Education and uh, I did my doctorate in uh, educational leadership. So um, what that means is it was a program that, um, you know, was designed to train not just researchers, but actually, you know, superintendents, principals and, and school district leaders um, as well. So uh, at the time, I thought, hey, I'm going to be an education professor someday. Like that's 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 my future. Um, but I also thought, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be a professor who has, you know, no real world working experience. It felt a little odd to me to be um, the idea of teaching in a school of education without having uh, worked in schools along the way. So uh, partway through my Ph.D., I, I decided, um, yeah, I'm going to get a I'm, I'm going to get a job, work full time and, uh, and and give this a try for for a little while. So. Um, so I got a job as uh, I guess researcher was technically the title, but. Um, it's probably what you'd recognize as an analyst role um, in the uh, school district in, in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, I spent about um, seven years there. So I uh, had a chance to yeah do analyst work for a little while. Then after I finished my PhD, um, became manager of a team and then eventually was um, running our research and program evalu evaluation office where we um, did you know survey design and administration, program evaluation projects. Um, you know, a lot of strategic planning support, um, as well as analytics that we uh, did um, largely in Tableau. So, um, yeah, at that point in in about 2019, um, it, it felt like time to to try something different for me. I'd been getting really into the visual analytics end of things and and wanted to you know take my career kind of more fully in that direction. So, um, did a little work as a uh, um, uh, consultant, uh, and then came on board into the uh, big tech world. Uh, you know, first as a contractor, and then moving into an FTE um, analytics developer position. Uh, and then in 2022, um, ended up starting my current role, which um, was originally titled uh, business analyst manager. But um, you know, now I am uh, managing a, a data science team. Um, and so I've been using Tableau as well since uh, 2012. Uh, I've been lucky enough to be a Tableau public ambassador for the last few years. Uh, Sarah mentioned the wonderful Tableau public uh, platform, which you should all um, yeah, use, explore, have a lot of fun with if you haven't had a chance to do that yet. Um, I've had, um, I think, about 10 uh, visits of the day highlighted on that platform by now. Um, and then for better or worse, um, I added a line here that um, you know, if people recognize 
me, it's it's usually for my projects, and it's usually because um, you know a lot of them uh, tended to do fairly well on on Reddit on the uh, on the data is beautiful community, um, which is actually how I was able to transition the industries and you know be able to show kind of um, a little bit more of what I was able to do. So um, this is just a screenshot with kind of some of my favorite uh, Tableau projects, uh, Tableau public projects in particular that I've that I've done over the years. Um, and a couple of them that have been um, kind of a, a little bit more recognized. Uh, yeah, mix of sports, pop culture stuff. Uh, just try to work on things that I'm curious about and interested in and figure out ways to, um, yeah, to, to do something cool in Tableau that, um, that uses them. Um, so for the past couple of years, too, uh, I have gotten really into um, screen printing as a hobby. So we uh, converted our garage to a little mini screen printing studio and um, I've also had fun kind of, um, you know, exploring the boundaries between Tableau and physical art and, and being able to use, um, you know, Tableau to develop uh, dashboards and, and things like that that then become, you know, ready for um, physical printing. So, um, you know, have a few, a couple of sports posters highlighted here, a, a music poster, um, the little uh, data tarot cards there, actually the, um, the photo of Jessica Moon earlier in this presentation, she's wearing um, that in in shirt form, uh, which is always you know super super fun to see. Um, but yeah, I've been working uh, with my wife under the uh, pie chart press imprint to to do some of this stuff. Um, so yeah, we've been doing the paper prints and also um, have some uh, shirt designs to to go along with it as well. The little bar graph black flag parody shirts if uh, if you happen to know the band um, and the the donut chart uh, shirt here. So. Um, yeah, this is this has been kind of something that I've also had um, a great time getting into over the past couple of years, and had a chance to speak about at a Tableau conference last year um, as well. So, uh, yeah, that's a little bit about about me, what I like to work on, and 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 some of the things that I've um, that I've been up to. Um, so, getting a little bit more specifically into um, what I'm here to talk about today. So um, I'm going to be focusing on specifically my uh, my entry for um, this past year's uh, Iron Biz qualifier uh, for the love theme. So uh, as Sarah mentioned, I've I've done this a bunch of times. Um, I've uh, entered the Iron Biz qualifiers probably five or six times by now, and yet haven't haven't quite made it to the big stage yet. But um, have always had you know a good a good learning experience doing it and. Uh, yeah, this is this is my freshest project, and um, you know, not just my most personal um, Iron Viz entry, but probably really the most personal uh, data project I've 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 ever worked on. Um, so this is a screenshot of the project. Um, I'll dive into it a little bit more, um, but really, you know, what's what's um, even more important to me than the project is is the story. And so this is a this is a photo of me and my dad a couple years ago, and. Uh, yeah, we, um, you know, unfortunately lost him uh, last summer after a uh, long battle with um, with cancer that, uh, yeah, he, he lived nearby. So I had a um, had a front row seat and was able to um, be there to to support him, support my mom, um, you know, through the whole process. And um, as much as it's a challenging topic, uh, you know, gr grief is a is a complicated and messy thing. And I think, you know, um, it's natural for people who like to create things to kind of fall back into creation as a way to um, help process those feelings and and figure out how how we're going to move forward. So, um, I'd had an idea for months that I wanted to do something, um, highlighting his journey and 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 highlighting our relationship um, because we, we we knew this was coming and uh, you know I had a I had a chance to talk with him about it, talk with my mom about it, and you know share kind of. Um, the plan to do something like this, and uh, um, when the Iron Viz competition was announced with the love theme, I thought, um, "Well, this is this is as good as a moment as um, as good of a moment as any to um, to dive in and um, and give this a shot." So, um, before I get further into the slides, just wanted to check out the. Uh, uh, comments, make sure I got those. Thanks, Sarah, for sharing. Uh, yeah, Austin FC season opener too. Very, uh, very excited here as well. We have the kit release party tonight too. And uh, yeah, love uh, love having that experience. Um, cool. So, all right. So yeah, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and, 
and dive into a little bit of a of a project highlight here. Um, so, so what I did for this project, um, this is definitely a case where I had to uh, build my own data set. And um, yeah, doing, doing that was uh, a, a very, um, very emotionally uh, challenging experience, uh, but um, you know, also, also interesting from a, from a technical standpoint. And um, yeah, just, uh, just interesting all around to, um, to do something like this. So, um, so what I did when I knew that I wanted to highlight something about his journey, you know, as, as strange as it is to think about, okay, well, what, what, what might we be able to, to, to graph? What might we be able to quantify? What are the things that, um, you know, that we can actually turn into um, data that we, that we might recognize for, for a project like this? And so, um, so I got a copy of his uh, medical records um, from, from the hospital system down here that, that handled his treatments. And so um, kind of step one in all of this was uh, working through um, almost 1,800 pages of records to um, figure out what what story we could draw out, what what patterns we could find, and so you know I have a, a couple of screenshots here of of the kinds of things I was working with, but um, you know there's a kind of a very detailed treatment record, a very you know detailed set of 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 doctor's notes, and kind of all the things that um, are are part of the journey when. Uh, when people and when families experience something like this, um, that um, you know we don't often see a holistic picture of of what that looks like. So um, this was step one, working through the medical records and thinking what happened and 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 when and um, what kind of patterns um, can we find within that. Um, and then step two, um, the more personal end of things, um, even more personal. Uh, I ended up working with the text message logs um, between me and my dad and having a chance to reflect on the conversations we had over the years and um, how those um, how those changed and and didn't change over time. Um, and then going back through uh, just the the photos on my phone uh, to help reconstruct you know our our personal history and um, and the things that that we had shared over the years. So from there, um, I had the I had the foundations. I had the you know the data pieces needed to um, to start to start diving into this a little bit more. And so, um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom in on some different parts of the project, kind of reflect on how I took um, that data and that experience and turned it into um, something that 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 more or less worked for Tableau. Um, and yeah, so. Um, so the first thing I did here was really just kind of highlight a um, a timeline of of what happened in between um, in between diagnosis and and um, you know when that when that journey came to an end. And so a lot of the project really did just kind of end up of um, being being themed around a calendar. You know we don't always think of a calendar as a data visualization tool. Um, maybe the people on this call do, but um, society maybe doesn't. But um, you know, yeah, it, it remains kind of one of the one of the most powerful pieces we have to, you know, kind of reconstruct a, a narrative of of um, you know how things how things developed over time. So, um, yeah, kind of started with that data set that was you know one row per day. Um, so these are not lines; these are a series of dots that are very close together that end up looking like a line. Um, but yeah, I had a chance to um, um, you know kind of kind of evolve everything from there. So. Um, so the first piece here, um, you know, I ended up kind of breaking down the experience into, um, you know, some of the, um, some of the major events that happened, um, you know, during, during this journey. And so, um, you know, largely his, his treatment occurred through, um, you know, radiation and, uh, and immunotherapy infusions. Um, and obviously with, you know, six hospitalizations along the way becoming, you know, pretty, um, pretty serious events that we had to deal with. Um, and then also just the, the, um, you know, the steady, the steady rhythm of, of scans and, um, and how that ended up looking over time. You know, if you, if you or anyone in your family has, has been through this experience, um, you know, you'll, you'll maybe know a little bit, um, about what this felt like. And so, um, you know, breaking this out both separately and then kind of putting it all into, 
um, you know, a, a calendar together was, um, you know, a, a useful way for me to kind of help pause and process and, and think through, you know, um, yeah, why, why, why it kind of felt like there was, there, there was always something and, and, you know, with, um, with such a long journey, you know, I think even within this, um, you know, can, you can kind of see the contours of when things were, were really, really active and really, really scary. Um, and then a couple stretches where, where things were a little quieter and, you know, some of those times where I have, you know, more positive memories of, of, of calm and, 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 you know, sharing, um, sharing those positive experiences along the way. So, um, you know, this, this is a simple graph. This is a few colors, a few dots. Um, you know, this is not something obviously that is, that is technically complex and, you know, everybody on this call could go make this graphic very quickly, but yet at the same time, you know, um, it was a powerful one for me to kind of help, um, re reconstruct that mental story and, uh, and think about, um, you know, what had, what had happened in our journey. So focusing particularly on the idea of love for, uh, for this year's Iron Viz theme, um, you know, I wanted to, um, make sure that this, this project was not just a, a medical record of all the challenging things that had happened, but also, um, you know, a celebration of, of some of the, some of the wonderful things we shared, um, you know, over the years. And so, um, so going through a text message log is, uh, is, is a really, uh, really powerful thing to do. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if y'all have, have, you know, ever, ever had the, the chance to, to do that, but, um, you know, I, I recommend it, um, you know, with people you love and care about who are, um, you know, even those who are still with us, it's, um, it's a powerful and cool thing to, to be able to, to reflect on. And so, um, I had imagined at the start that this would be something that would, um, you know, be really affirming. And in a lot of ways it, it, it was, you know, the, um, the, the love shared back and forth, even literally the, the use of the word love in text messages that I highlighted, um, you know, in the little radial, radial graphic at the right there, um, you know, it was powerful and positive in that sense. Um, but also, you know, challenging because, you know, I think, um, you know, with, with the nature of his disease and the progression of the illness, um, you know, the, the, the graph at the left here, um, you know, kind of became one of the more powerful ones to me as I was working on this too, to, to really tell, um, you know, the story of, of, of what was going on. And, you know, we used to text all the time and have, you know, long detailed conversations and, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, in the last, uh, in the last six months or so of his life, he, he wasn't, he wasn't able to do that anymore. And so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a reflection of, of, of something hard and, serious and challenging, but, you know, hopefully, um, hopefully also something with some, some affirmation and some, um, and some love included along the way. So, um, you know, I don't have time to dive into every graph, but, you know, wanted to, um, wanted to highlight, um, you know, again, kind of the positivity and, um, the fact that, you know, and, and, an illness like this, um, doesn't, doesn't define a person's life, doesn't define the experience, doesn't, doesn't define the journey that a, that a family has together. And so, you know, we dealt with, um, you know, three and a half years of, of managing this challenge and, and, and being on this journey together. But, you know, there were um, 68 years before that, that included, you know, a, a wonderful long marriage and, and, and my life and, and, you know, the, the welcoming of two grandchildren along the way. And, uh, you know, really a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of positives and you know a lot of a lot of wonderful memories too. So, um, you know, I know I know it's a it's a it's a heavy project. It's certainly the hardest hardest project I've ever worked on. But um, you know, I think finding that balance between um, you know de dealing with heavy issues and and also finding some 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 hope and optimism and and love within them, um, you know, became a really a really interesting challenge. And so, um, wanted to reflect on you know kind of working with personal data and, and, and what it means to do something like this, um, you know, kind of, um, opening, opening your heart up for a, for a data project is, is, you know, not something people always think about and, you know, kind of the, the stereotypical Tableau use case out there isn't going to be, you know, something like this. Um, but for me, it was, a it was a powerful experience to do this. And so, um, bringing in as many personal elements as possible, um, felt like a, like a, like a good way to heal. And so, um, 
you know, not only was the project kind of naturally and, and, and you know, inherently incredibly personal, um, but, um, you know, was able, able to bring some, some touches from other aspects of life in there. Um, you know, the project had uh, graphic elements that included, you know, some marigolds, some poppies, um, and those are actually, um, you know, elements I pulled directly out of um, some of my uh, wife's designs that, that she's gotten into as, as we've done screen printing. So, um, you know, emphasizing the family connection, emphasizing, you know, we all, we all kind of play, play our role in journeys like this. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it was a, an, a, a deep, deep experience for me. And so, um, obviously sharing a project like this online is, is, is its own kind of unique thing. It always is. It's always tough to put your work out there. Um, so I, I always admire and respect anybody who's, who's, who's willing to share. Um, it can be even a little tougher sometimes when, when the topic gets so personal. But um, I did want to share um, just um, some of the comments that I got from people, um, particularly on Reddit, as I did have a chance to, um, you know, sh share this project over there. And, um, you know, I won't, I won't read, read through all of them, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's a hard topic. It's a challenging thing to deal with. It's a challenging thing to process through. Um, but I was heartened by how how sharing something like this, um, you know, reminded people of their own journeys, of their own journeys with their parents. And um, I'm always grateful when a data project, um, you know, particularly something that people often think of as as a business intelligence tool, um, you know, it has the capability to be um, so much more than that. Um, yeah. So I think I think for me it was, and uh, I think for me this was kind of a, a singular project and and uh, um, a really unique um, experience to have gone through. Um, so thinking a little bit about this project and how it fits into something like um, like Iron Viz. So um, I do I do want to be upfront and say that you know. Um, as I think about doing work like this, and as I think about how it fits into the context of what Iron Viz is, um, I probably would not do um, a project like this for something like Iron Viz again. And um, and I guess the reason that that, that I say that is that um, you know I, I think it I think it's only natural when um, you know the Tableau ecosystem um, has a lot of really fun, cool opportunities, and some of them do end up becoming you know fairly competitive and uh you know competition can be fun um but you know there is always kind of the reality for something like iron viz that you're going to have you know literally hundreds of amazing entries from you know amazing people and and you know talented individuals all over the world and you know i think it is okay to acknowledge that it can be a little disappointing if, if you don't necessarily finish where you were hoping and um you know i think for me um i think those feelings can be magnified when when it does become something so personal so um, you know, I think um, I think my kind of generic advice, if you're thinking about Iron Viz, if you're thinking about personal projects, if you're thinking about, you know, diving into something that has a special emotional resonance for you, um, I would personally encourage people to maybe disconnect that from anything that feels like a competition or something where, um, you know, there are then results at the end where it can feel like, um, you know, whether you like it to or not, kind of a value judgment on on, on your experience. I think that um, this project was was very important and and uh, you know very meaningful for me to go through. Um, at the same time, um, probably might have worked a little bit better as as a standalone project, as opposed to something um, that um, that kind of fit within that uh, that Iron Viz context. Um, so you know, closing thoughts. Um, I think it's always important when we're doing projects like this um, to to do something because you want to. Um, and not for the validation. And I mean validation kind of in the, in the broader sense that, you know, um, there, there's a lot of opportunities for us to put data projects out into the world because we love to, and there's a lot of opportunities to do it as part of something that could feel a little bit more competitive. So whether it's Iron Viz, the Information is Beautiful Awards, you know, something like the Tableau Public Vizs of the Day, you know, um, all of those are, are cool and, you know, end up resulting in um, you know, cool stuff being highlighted and, you know, what well-deserving entries, um, you know, being, um, being showcased. Um, but I do think ultimately at the end of the day, um, chasing those types of, of rewards, awards, validations, you know, um, is, is, is probably not, um, 
probably not something that tends to leave people feeling great about their work in the long term. You know, I think those of us who've been at this for a little while and sharing work publicly for a little while, um, you know, have, have kind of talked about this a lot. And it's it's important to um, it's important to do these projects for their inherent value and and for for what they are to us as opposed to what they are as part of a competition. Um, I think I'd also say handle sensitive data with care and you know take that however that means to you. You know, I, I spent um, you know a solid ten years if you count part of grad school working with um, you know education data that was often very very sensitive. You know, um, individual children's stories really. Um, and this is another example of that of that highly sensitive data. You know, sometimes we're dealing with medical issues, personal challenges, things like that. And 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 I think it's important to um, to handle that um, with with care. And um, it was important to me to talk with my dad and my mom about this project before I went on this journey to make sure everybody uh, felt good about it. Um, and and I think too that includes care for yourself. You know, uh, this is probably the first Tableau project I've ever worked on where I had to take meaningful breaks from it because um, it was too you know kind of emotionally tough to to work through. And so I think you know it doesn't have to be just those of us who are working in you know healthcare or education or or those areas that we kind of naturally recognize as sensitive. But you know these these personal stories are important and and sometimes uh, but sometimes you have to take care of yourself when you're um, when you're working with this stuff too. Um, and finally, this could probably be a closing thought for any data presentation I give. Um, you know, have fun. Do your do your best to have fun. Um, if a project isn't fun, it's okay to stop. You know, um, Tableau Public is wonderful. The Tableau community is wonderful. I've 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 gotten so much meaning and connection and and everything from it. Um, but yeah, it's um, ultimately it is for a lot of us kind of an extra thing. And um, if you need to step away, if you need to take a break. Um, that's okay too. So with that, I am uh, coming up on my time, uh, but I have a couple minutes left. So um, yeah, if you have any other kind of questions, comments, whatever, I'm keeping an eye on the chat here. Happy to talk through anything that comes in. Um, Thank you so much, Bo, um, it, and and thank you for sharing the the reaction and. Uh, too. Again, it, I'm glad I wasn't the only one crying over <laughs> over a dashboard. <laughs> um, I, and, and for your your honesty with re reflecting on this project and um, like how how it fits into your work. Um, do you have any? One question I had was. Um, like when you're working on a personal project, do you do you have a visual in mind when you're um, going into like do you um, where do you get your ideas from? where um, and how do you make decisions about those ideas? Uh, you mentioned something about how grief is so, messy and up and down um, and complicated. And um, the viz it tells a cohesive um, story with different parts. Um, how, how do you navigate that? Yeah, yeah, that's a really, that's a really good and interesting question. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, I think I'll start with the the easier part, um, I guess, in terms of um, design ideas, um, you know, I, I think uh, I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit, but there's a, you know, there's a, a borrow like an artist, um, you know, I expression, <laughs> and uh, and I think, um, you know, for this in particular, um, you know, I, I I do live in in Austin, Texas, I live uh, very close, like just up the road from um, San Antonio, that has the um, largest Dia de los Muertos festival, um, you know, in the world outside of Mexico. And so we always go and participate in that every fall. And uh, the motif of the, um, uh, you know, the, the marigolds is, you know, kind of consistent throughout that holiday and throughout that festival, you know, as a way to kind of help us, you know, uh, um, remember the, you know, the presence of, of the people who've left us. And so I kind of had this idea of, 
you know, the black, white, and orange marigold motif um, that, it, that I wanted to bring in really very much from the start because I, I associate that with, um, you know, with the subject. And so um, I think going along with that, um, I think some of the secondary colors, I, I think I ended up borrowing from the modern San Antonio Spurs logos because I knew they were gonna look really good with black. And so um, that's that's kind of where those um, um, those design elements, um, you know, ended up coming from and then started, you know, just building the structure of the project from there as well. Um, you know, I personally have, have tended to be somebody who likes to make projects that work well as just an image as well. So like for me, I wanted this to be something that, um, yeah, I like to make projects that are going to resonate outside the Tableau community, ideally, as well, that you don't necessarily have to download and unpack the workbook to kind of see everything that's there, but that um, but that it does work as an image. So um, definitely wanted to be conscious of that the whole time, which is why it's not necessarily the longest project. I know particularly for, you know, Iron Viz, you're going to see a lot of click throughs, a lot of like really, really long scrolly telling dashboards that are amazing, cool, technical accomplishments, um, but not really, not really my style. So, you know, particularly for something like this, um, I wanted to make sure it's going to, it's going to hold up as an image too, which is why it's not bigger um, than it is. Um, and then, yeah, the, you know, the graphs themselves, I think, um, I wish I had kind of a more specific answer to it, but I think for a lot of us, you know, it, it often is just kind of a matter of getting your data set, loading it into Tableau and just kind of dragging and dropping a bunch of things until you see something that like that you like and then um, and then start kind of kind of building from there. So um, yeah, I think that's that's generally my my design reflection. yeah, I had I had colors and a motif that I knew about from the beginning and then the graphs themselves were kind of just experimenting until I liked something. Thank you. Um, we we had a question uh, too of, um, uh, I love your creativity and design. Any help for someone like me with struggles with that? Um, and that's from Oluwasan. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Yeah, I would say, um, yeah, you know, I, I think for me, it, it's often a matter of like, I'll say when I started trying to do more creative data projects, you know, a lot of it came from just looking at other projects that I really loved and trying to find inspiration in them. And so I think for, you know, doing this creative work, I think for a lot of people, it often starts as like, can I do a little modification on this thing that that I found that I that I really like? Um, you know, this this other project that I think is super cool. What if I change the data set a little bit and change the colors a little bit? And like, can I give a new spin on it? And so, um, I think some of the things I did early on definitely, you know, started that way, particularly before I was kind of more involved with the, um, you know, the broader community. I was developing in Tableau, you know, just during my day job for six years before I ever put anything on Tableau Public. And so I think like that was my time period of like, hey, what can I what can I borrow from other folks? And then I think, um, you know, I think through, kind of through practice and, and through trying different things and kind of seeing how they resonate with different people. Um, you know, I do think you start to develop your own style. And so I feel like I'm still kind of looking for inspiration everywhere all the time, um, but less so in the form of graphs and dashboards and more so in the form of, you know, anything, books, posters, architecture, you know, whatever, just kind of being out in the world and seeing like, hey, this is something I really like, this is really cool. Can I make a graph or a dashboard that is, you know, kind of, kind of reflective of this? So I think, um, you know, I, I think there are people who are kind of, you know, maybe have kind of an, a natural gift for design and from the time they're, you know, children or have all of these ideas, you know, independently. Um, and that's awesome if if you are one of those people. But I think, um, you know, if not, I do think creativity is something that can be practiced. And sometimes, yeah, sometimes it starts with imitation um, uh, while you while you figure out your own style and, you um, yeah, over time, I think that evolves. Yeah, we sometimes we think of creativity as such a like inherent, like something you have or you don't. And uh, it, thinking about it as something you can practice is um, the kind of uh, like kind of nice that that you can work on it and, and grow in uh, your creativity. Um, yeah. 
So have you um, shared the biz with uh, your family and did it, um, we had a, a question about that and if that's like, uh, and, and how they reacted to it. And if that's too personal. Mm -hmm. No, wondered. that's okay. No, I'm happy to share it. Um, yeah, so I would say, you know, I, I, I shared it with my wife kind of all along the way. Um, you know, I think uh, I, I, my mom saw it recently. Um, I, I think sharing it with her was not necessarily, she ended up finding it because she heard me talking about it. I didn't necessarily want to share it with her explicitly and say, look, you know, work through this. Because I know as much as the experience was, you know, challenging and um, challenging for me, you know, I, I thought it might be even maybe a little more challenging for for her to, you know, reflect on on kind of some of the stuff that was there. So, um, you know, she saw it. She said it was it was very powerful. But, you know, we didn't talk deeply, deeply about it. But um, but yeah, sharing, sharing, sharing with my wife and really sharing with friends was also kind of a um, a powerful um, thing to have done. But yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, thank you so much for um, sharing uh, your your work with us, and um, and um, we we really appreciate it. So um, yeah, and thank you. keep on making the sports ball thizzes too. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Yeah, appreciate it. And thanks, everyone. Yeah, always always a pleasure to speak with this group. And yeah, I really appreciate y'all being here. Thank you. All right. Um, switching gears, uh, real left turn. <laughs> yeah, um, we have our attendance prize giveaway, and um, we did a uh, drawing of the um, names of the participants, and um, our um, and the winner is Nikki Perry. Um, and, um, Nikki, are you still here? Yay. All right. Uh, congratulations. I will, um, d uh, DM you, uh, in, uh, Bevy, uh, to, um, get your email address to send you the Tableau gift card. So congratulations. Uh, so, uh, be on the lookout for that. All right. Um, up next, we have um, our presenter, um, Corinna uh, Spitalnik. And Corinna, uh, Corinna has three passions, good design and better data, and the great outdoors. Growing up outside Atlanta, Georgia, she spent her childhood days drawing and painting and exploring backyard trails with friends and constantly learning new things. Uh, these passions never change. They just evolved into a first career teaching the visual arts and pursuing higher education at the University of Georgia. After attending a Tableau user group in early 2018, she discovered that data analytics is a wonderful way to merge her interests and challenge her on a new career path. She still utilizes is um she's sorry lost my place oh look at your pup so sweet <laughs> oh <laughs> um <laughs> um and she is an analytics consultant um, it, at Interworks and is based out of Atlanta, Georgia. And we're so happy uh, to have her here with us today to guide us through asking better questions. Uh, Corinna, thanks so much for joining us. And um, I'll uh, stop sharing my screen so uh, you can share yours. Right. Thanks, Sarah. And Bo just wanted to say I'm very touched by your presentation. Um, I think you mentioned like, hey, it's really hard to do personal stuff and maybe that's not what we enter in contests. But I think it's a great place to enter it. I think it really brings the humanity sometimes back into data stories. And so thank you for your courage and willingness to share that story. I know a lot of people probably can relate to having to care for somebody who's going through that. So thanks, Bo. 
Um, so I'm going to shift gears to a little more light, lighthearted here for the ending. But as Sarah said, my name is Corinna. I'm an anal analyst consultant with InnerWorks. Um, we are a full stack data analytics consulting company. If you've ever been to a Tableau conference, we're one of their gold partners. So you'll see big InnerWorks booths, um, lots of Oklahoma people. That's where we're based. I usually take time to do that um, icebreaker, but we already kind of did that. So since today it's all about asking questions, we're gonna start with a question game. And if you remember 20 questions as a kid, you are going to, and you can put these in the chat, you can only ask me questions that I answer yes or no to, and you're trying to guess a superhero. I am a super big nerd. I love all things Disney and Marvel. So i am narrowed the category and this is specifically Marvel superheroes. So if you're that nerdy and you know the distinction, I've already brought the window down. So first question, pop in the chat. We're trying to guess who I am. Only I can only respond yes, no. I guess Bo and Sarah could come off mute if they wanted to just ask one. Chris says, are they male? No. Can you fly? No. Is your main color red? No. Good question. <laughs> Probably not, no. The superheroes already know from our question so far, they are female. Their main color is not red, or they identify as female. Their main color is not red, and they're probably not a fan of Trump. Do they wear a mask? Uh, no, they do not. Not as a part of their uniform. That's a good one, though. Sarah's now connecting with me. Are they named after a spider? Yes. George, you want to just pop the answer in the window? I think you know who it is. Yeah, yeah, Black Widow. All right. So we got there in one, two, three, four, quest five questions. So fantastic. Um, and I thought this was a nice way to kick this off because it has us sort of already thinking about the kinds of questions we ask, right? When we play 20 questions, we usually start with questions to narrow down that category. So asking male or female, pretty good starter question. You're already cutting your group of <laughs> superheroes in half that way. So we think there's four characteristics of strong questions. Starting with strong questions are personal. So personal doesn't always mean personal to your work life right away. But asking personal, low-risk, inviting questions kind of helps you get to know who you're interacting with. Now, I'm going to be talking about all of these throughout this presentation. There's no reason to write this down quickly. I'll also send the deck to Sarah. Just always have some examples here on the right of what I mean by the type of question. So even asking you what your coffee order was or what you like to have at a coffee shop. Personal, low-risk. We also think strong questions are specific. So trying to get as specific you can, um, you can narrow down questions talking about the time frame, a category, or a feeling, right? So I told you a category, superheroes, specifically Marvel superheroes, really helped us frame our questions. We also think strong questions are within context. So same thing we did here. I'm giving you a context of the questions. And asking context questions means sticking to the topic at hand or guiding questions that help bring about honest responses that you know to be important in a project or in an account. So for example, I'm working on an internal project here at InnerWorks and we've sort of had a, a delayed timeline. And I can tell the enablement lead I'm working with is getting a little frustrated. So last week before our check-in, uh, this week, I said, hey, what's one thing you would like me to pro to progress on over the next week? So that I mean, we were kind of trying to spe specify that task list. Task list. Man, 
warm up my voice here for today. Um, the last thing too that we look at is that good questions, strong questions, get progressively complex. So this characteristic takes some building, and I'll talk about this more in the presentation, but the key to asking more complex questions is listening to your person's responses, taking time sometimes to process and synthesize, and then coming back with even more developed questions. So our goal typically with asking questions in data visualization or in data analytics is to get to the heart of the matter, right? We wanna pinpoint a problem. We wanna start exploring solutions. However, this doesn't happen with just well thought out questions. It happens with building a relationship with your client. So in the chat too, just to kind of keep us all engaged here, if you wanna write, what areas do you want to improve your questions? So when you signed up for this, um, tug, I was about to say webinar, I signed up for this tug, press all the topics and said, ooh, I, I could learn something from that. So I'm just curious, what areas do you want to improve in your questions? And some of the topics I'm going to talk about today um, were gathered in two different ways. So there's two resources that um, would highly recommend continuing on. One is this book called The Book of Beautiful Questions by Warren uh, Berger, Berger. And then this other one by Hal uh, Greger Gregerson is actually the one of the it came from the quote that's on the board right now is called Questions Are the Answer. And essentially talks about how we always think answers are the answer, but there is, you see on the screen here, for there are a few things as useless, if not dangerous, as the right answer to the wrong question. So we're gonna we're gonna get into this a little bit more today. But just to prepare for this presentation, I actually gathered a bunch of people from InnerWorks, um, people from our marketing team, our go-to-market, other consultants. And I said, where have good questions got us? So when we asked a good question, what was the result? And I kind of took their answers and framed this presentation based on what they answered of where good questions got us. So the three topics I'm gonna to cover are people first. We think that good data starts with people, not data. We're gonna talk about the heart of the matter, so getting into the meat of why we're creating a visual, which Bo just very beautifully shared um, ahead of me. And then also questions in the weeds. So when we're getting down to actually building something, working on a solution, creating a dashboard, what are some questions we need in that specific area? All right, so people first. So if you've ever attended one of our InnerWorks webinars, uh, Jenny Parnell is our marketing director. And we ask questions before, during, and after the webinar. Some of them are like in the form of polls. Some of them are just answering in the chat window and some are actually surveys we send afterwards. But the point of all of these is that we're learning who our audience is and we're learning how we can best serve our, our clients and our customers. And recently Jenny's been compiling all these responses and running them through an AI summary generator which will help us uncover like the top responses. So if a lot of people are saying we're having issues in data management, then we know to reach out, do another webinar on data management. It helps us develop content and it helps us drive our content based on what our clients need. So we call these types of questions curiosity questions. And the goal is to be specific yet to be inviting. So these are questions that people can respond to quickly. They don't have to think very hard to respond. Kind of that low risk personal question or something specific to their business. Now it's important when we're asking to not only think about what we're saying, but how we're saying it, especially if it's digital, especially if it's through communication. So not only am I gonna talk about 
the type of question. So we have the type right now is curiosity. But the attitude you need to have when you're approaching this type of question. So for curiosity questions, you should be attentive. So if you're just talking to a client for the first time, getting to know them, you're on camera or maybe you're in person. You want to keep eye contact. You also want to make sure you have open arms. It's amazing how many people will not talk or reply if they are arms are crossed, slouched on a table, camera down, head down. So leaning in, making sure you are letting your person know you're here to listen. You want to make sure you're responsive. So it's okay to pause, process what's being said, and think about what they're saying, not just thinking about your next question. This will help you get more authentic responses from who you're questioning. We need to be empathetic. So watching for tone, body language. And the biggest one that I try to set myself up for success here is distractions. It is okay if you're talking to a client or team members to say, hey, I'm taking notes on this conversation. I may pause and look back on them during our conversation. It's also okay to say, you seem distracted. Like, let's revisit this later. Or before the meeting, I will typically even ask people, hey, can you close your other browser windows and let's devote our time together so we, we make the most of it. We also want to make sure we're inviting. So making sure that others can interpret your question the correct way. So am I asking something too gender specific? Am I making gender assumptions in this question? Maybe I'm assuming something based on a leadership role. I just recently heard the, uh, the phrase hippo, highest paid person's opinion. So we're talking about avoiding the hippo, like making sure everyone in the room is heard. So even specifically calling out someone or saying, hey, I'd like you to follow up with me later or send me an email because you were very quiet in this meeting. So some examples, I just put some fun sort of curiosity questions that are personal, but also ones that might be related to a project. So me asking your favorite coffee shop order, very easy, low risk, personal question, curiosity question. Um, try to have, uh, be specific enough that avoids sort of vague and common responses. So even thinking of a question you ask frequently, like, how are you today? Most people just reply, fine, good or nothing at all. So changing that question a little bit, what's on your mind? Or what's one thing on your mind today? I'm asking for a specific, what's one thing on your mind? Or what's one thing on your mind today about this project timeline? Now I'm even more specific. I've added time frame and I've added a category. So even kind of thinking of this as you're having conversations internally, how can I make my specific make my questions a little more specific and a little more personal. So at the end of each of these sections, uh, when I looked up the word curiosity on, uh, I used this program called Uns Unsplash to find free, royalty-free images, this llama came up. So he is our summary llama. So when you see the llama, if you've been toning out for a while, you can be like, ooh, wait, Corona has something important. So summary on curiosity. Um, Curiosity questions establish trust and help you learn the dynamics of the team. So remember, people are behind every part of the data cycle. Knowing your client or stakeholder or audience helps you discern when and how to ask strong questions. And these questions immediately give you and your client a similar goal, right, to learn something new about each other. And when you kick off a project like that, you're you're automatically kind of on the same side, on the same team. And I'm sort of speaking as a consultant here, but even if you're working with internal teams, you can approach it this way. Okay, now I'm going to dive a little bit deeper. I was kind of intro questions, getting to know people, part of the matter. So this story, true story. Um, like a lot of other data analysts in the year 2020, I um, actually I used to work for Tableau. So I started off as a trainer 
And then I can shift, and I shifted in, into consulting so I didn't have to travel as much. And one of the first accounts I was ever on was COVID data. And then the second account was COVID vaccination, which kind of the nice side. And we were assigned, we were working with um, the state of Hawaii. And this is a great example of asking questions to get to the heart of the matter. So when we started the account, we of course got on a kickoff call and said, hey, how can we help? What do you need? And they said, we need public facing dashboards to share vaccination rates in the state. Cool, what else? Well, we need a tool that can combine public data, data from pharmacies and data from government bases in Hawaii because uh, we don't have a centralized vaccine repository yet. Okay, what else? We need a server that can handle this data and is secure. Uh, great, what else do you need? Well, we need data that'll exclude uh, any PII, so it's updated daily. Big list of things, right? We say, okay, well, anything else we should know before we start on those priorities. And at this point, the, uh, the lead epidemiologist gives this huge sigh. He's like, well, we have these internal dashboards that I manage, and they're only for our leaders to view um, before data goes public. But you know what? We can, we can do this later. And I said, no, no, tell me more about that. Can you elaborate? He said, well, I've got like basic sheets and before the data goes public, you know, this whole leadership team has to approve the data. So I screenshot my Tableau charts and I put them in an email every day and I push it out to these leaders. And I said, so this is your internal approval process. He's like, yeah, I know it's not the best. I said, well, it sounds like this is a priority before we even start on your public dashboards on your new server because they have to go through this process before we push them to the public. Is, is that correct? And he was like, yeah, yeah. I said, well, can you share those dashboards with me? So it'll also give me an idea of what your team's been seeing for the past couple of weeks and where I need to start building as a, as a developer. And then I also told him, I said, you know, what we could do is, is make this dash, these dashboards kind of like slides. And then we can use Tableau's subscribe feature so that you can just push this out automatically every morning. You don't have to screenshot it and then make another email. He looked so relieved, right? He was so excited that we could instantly give him some value. So what happened here? First, our client, they had an idea of what, the, what their solution would be, and they had a very long list of priorities. But because we spent time listening and taking notes, and we kind of kept probing with this what else question, we turned out to find that critical piece needed to happen before all the other things. And we ended that conversation with a way to give them immediate, immediate value, which was great because we also had to take time to build them a server. And that was gonna take a, little, a couple weeks. So we call these types of questions exploratory questions. So if you remember the commercials back in the 80s, um, how many licks does it take to get the center of a Tootsie Roll Pop? This is what you're doing in this stage of questioning. You are trying to get to the center. These questions can help you explore issues or gain insights into the past, present, or future perspectives on an assignment or project. So with exploratory questions, be inquisitive. You want to be non-judgmental. So if I had said, oh my gosh, these dashboards are so lame. I can't believe you've been sharing these internally. You know, I would have cut off that relationship. Instead, hey, I'd like to see them. I want to know where, where we're starting from. And this guy was a very brand new Tableau user. He had been doing the best he could with what he had. And he actually had some decent visualizations that were very specific to epidemiology. And I had to say, okay, general public, we've got to pare this down to like the basics. So they ended up being super helpful. And my inquisitive, non-judgmental questions helped him keep sharing. You also want to do some keyword listening here and also listening to 
that body position and, and phrases. This guy seemed so exhausted from cutting and pasting pictures in an email every single day. And I could tell if we could take this off his plate, his resources would be better spent doing other things with his time. We also want to make sure you're, you're paraphrasing so you understand what your client or customer or team member is saying. So one of my um, bad and or good habits from being um, a, a PhD person, and Bo probably relates to this, uh, I take very copious notes about everything. I'm just constantly taking notes. And I also try to put little notes about things like client's tone, attitude, and just the overall vibe of what's going on. I feel like it helps me remember how to follow up later, especially if you're having like back-to-back -back meetings. Sometimes you forget this person seemed irritated or this person seemed excited. So what happens when a client isn't sure of their problem or situation? Um, these were actually some questions that go-to-market strategist Carl Redette uh, helped me with. He said he's got a couple well crafted exploratory questions that he'll ask. Um, one of them always being, why are we doing this? You know, often when we come in to develop a dashboard, people have an idea of the what, and sometimes they're eight steps away from the why, whether they've already been talking about it. But as somebody coming in new to a project, I will repeatedly ask, why are we doing this? And another question he uses, I have this on the screen, is the what happens if we don't do this? So if we don't build this dashboard or we don't do the solution, what are you stuck with? And that's a kind that questioning, thinking about past, present, or future. We're usually trying to develop for the future, but it's sometimes good to ask, well, what happened in the past? What worked or didn't work? Um, and sometimes this also helps gain consensus. Thanks, that's a great tip. Taking notes by attitude. Yeah, it's, it's like a thing you forget later, right? You can always remember what people say, but sometimes you forget their attitude and that can be just as helpful. Um, all right, so llama tip, don't be afraid of asking too many questions. There is value in reaching the core. All right, this last part, I'm gonna go a little bit quickly so we have some time for open Q&A here. So in the weeds, and you can add this in the chat too. I would love to have this on notes at the very end, but what is your biggest obstacle in dashboard development? So when you're actually trying to build a visual, what do you think is your biggest obstacle? And like the biggest said, optional uh, obstacle personally, like, or? Yeah, can be personally, it could be in your department, it could be the process, just kind of. And if you don't think of something now, we can always kind of circle back to that. So Nikki said she wants to know about the best questions to ask during requirement gathering at the beginning of a project. And someone gave that a thumbs up. So Nikki, you're going to love this section because we're going to chat a little bit about that as well. Uh, problematic data sets. Developing visuals before having a plan for the dashboard. Yeah, um, I sometimes jump into color palettes right away. I'm like, ooh, I want to just start with the design and then I have to um, back up. <laughs> so let's say you're already working on a project and the stakeholder stakeholders are pretty vague. Uh, Think of some of these statements. If you agree with these, you can kind of just thumbs up in the chat. Just show me the numbers. We just need to see X metric over time. Or the dreaded, can you just replicate the spreadsheet? Right. So how do you dig deeper with questions? So this next set is actionable questions. And I think these are the hardest, but probably the ones that we get the most value out of. So instead of broad, big picture questions like those for scoping in the, um, what I just talked about, <laughs> actionable questions are specific and they're organized by category and often allow for a variety of responses. So consider 
types of questions like multiple choice, surveys, range of agreement, like agree, disagree, and then timed responses. These are all types of questions that kind of work really well in trying to gain quick, meaningful insights from your users. So actionable questions are going to be questions around solutioning. So does this solution work? Is this what we intended? This is an iterative thing. So one of the things we do at InnerWorks, and I have a quick slide to share in this little section, we have a course we offer called Design Thinking for Dashboard. I mean, sorry, Design Thinking for Data Visualization. It was called User-Centered Dashboard Design. Same topic. We're now focusing on the design thinking process, which puts users at the center and helps you come up with a dashboard building process that's iterative. So you're not just like collecting requirements at the beginning and then showing them a finished dashboard at the end, which is sometimes what we do. But having users built in through the entire cycle, so having them at the beginning, helping with things like wireframes and MVPs, the minimum viable products. That's what the course is about. And what we do is we teach you how to do the design thinking process internally with, with your own teams. So I say that just to say it's all about that iterative question asking. You're also going to have specific categories. And then a variety of responses. So this is an example. It might be a little hard to read, depending on how big your screen is. But um, during dashboard development, we kind of break it up into these phases. So understand and define are like the first phase of clarifying a problem. And I have a great example of this. I'm going to share the story very quickly. So I was working with um, a quick service restaurant chain. And they wanted me to build a dashboard based on an, an original report, which was, you guessed it, a cross tab. And they had seven metrics with seven rankings. So like if your sales for your restaurant was this number and then you were ranked 17th out of you know 1,000 restaurants. So 14 metrics in all. And you can already imagine a lot on the dashboard, right? And they had taken a stab at building this internally and kind of called us in to help with necessary calculated fields and things. And during this stage of understand and define, I asked questions like, well, what are the pain points right now in your, because um, the restaurant owners were the ones looking at this report. So what are your pain points now from the restaurant owner's side? What do they not like about the current report? And they said, well, the point is for really them to look at their ranking quickly. They want to know where they rank with all the other restaurants so they can improve. So if they're ranked 20, they want to see number 19, 18, 17, so they can see how they can improve. And I was like, okay, if that's the focus, then let's take away this huge 14 metric thing. Let's give a couple little spotlight cards that show your rank and highlight that number first, and then put the metrics smaller underneath. So you can quickly see I'm ranked 19th in sales, but but 85th in transactions, and I'm ranked 37th in my order accuracy. We ended up with a very beautiful, clean dashboard because we took time to do these questions. So these kind of on the left, um, leading, understand, and define, it's just like a progression of specificity. So we start with something like, what's the purpose of this dashboard? But then we lead into what decisions what business decisions does this dashboard support? So with the fast food chain, the purpose was for them to see their ranking, but the decision was once they saw their ranking, reach out to their other owners and have a little friendly competition, but also see who's in comparison to them so they can improve. So we wanted to highlight that action in the dashboard, not just the data. All right, and we're right at one or twelve twenty-five. It's one twenty-five. I'm on Eastern time, so I'm going to do these kind of fast. This is the workshop I was telling you about. We've just changed the name to Design Thinking for Data Visualization. 
if it's something your organization's interested in, you can look it up on our InnerWorks website. Um, but again, it's I'm, I teach this process of clarify problems, ideate solutions, quickly do things like wireframing, sketching, chart type, decision making. We kind of go through all of that. Um, it's an eight hour workshop, but we split it up over four days. So two hours a day for four days. And um, I'm super excited about the revisions because they're way more hands on. We do a lot of fun activities and creative thinking activities too. Here's some examples of actionable questions. And I'm going to push this out to Sarah later so you can take more time to read it then. But just remember that the more questions you ask, the more you simplify your work. So if I had built this fast food chain, a rush, uh, you know, a dashboard that showed these 14 metrics and it turned out to be a disaster, I would have wasted all this time instead of, uh, like I sent them a couple of very ugly wireframes, but it had an idea of what the dashboard could look like when it was done, what data we needed, um, how the data had to look per region and things like that. Okay, very quickly, final cues. So I'm actually going to skip this. <laughs> so how do I get better at asking questions? Um, one thing you can do, keep attending tugs, um, continuing your own education, reading blogs, uh, going to conference. If you've never been to a Tableau conference, mind blowing. You'll be surrounded by the best data nerds ever. Um, collect resources. I actually have one to send Sarah that she can push out to you. It's a little one pager on the topics I've talked about today. And then the other thing is to practice and document. You know, that sounds tedious, like take notes, but the more you document what works and what doesn't work, the better you can get at it. So my first couple of years teaching, like I used to be an art teacher for K-12 schools. And my first mentor told me to have tricks in my back pocket. And what she meant by that was I should have tools that are ready to go when I need them. And it was related to the classroom. I'm also a cyclist. So if you've ever seen cyclists biking, you have these ridiculous pockets that sit on your back and they're filled with the things you need. Food, maybe a water bottle, sunglasses, earbuds. If you're on a really long bike ride, you might have some toilet paper stashed in there, but they're the essentials. So my recommendation for you is as you're trying to build your skills and asking questions is to have some of those back pocket questions, collect good questions, write them down, questions that get people talking or get people excited. Critique your own process. So at the end of a meeting, give yourself three minutes to just what went well, what fell flat, you know, what, what could I use again? And then combine things you see other people using that works well. So I, I used to do this as a Tableau trainer. I would write down questions and just verbatim ask them back to the students the way the previous trainer had done. But then I started to build, you know, my technique and change it. Um, I used to have a bunch of sticky notes all over my screen to help me with that. The last little point, and then we'll open up to Q&A if we have a couple more minutes. You have to hop, I understand. Um, when I was pursuing my PhD, uh, people told me that the dirty little secret of higher ed is that they can't teach you how to teach. You're just sort of expected to know how to teach. So the dirty little secret about asking questions, and I saved it for last, is that sometimes the best questions are not questions at all. Sometimes they're things like, tell me more. Or can you elaborate? And my favorite one is when somebody says something that might be demeaning or might be out of place or sometimes has a racial tone or especially an insensitive to LGBTQ community tone. This is one of my back pocket phrases. You said this for a reason. I'd like to know why. And it's a really powerful statement to let someone own what they've asked or what they've said, especially if it's out of context. As a woman, an LGBTQ member too, I've been in situations where if someone says something 
demeaning to me as a woman or maybe expecting me to not have the expertise that I have. And I will frequently throw this back at them in a very polite way. You said this for a reason. I'd like to know why. And I may not have an answer, but that's one of my big walk away tips today. So if you're a quiet person in the room, if you're an introvert like Sarah, sometimes you are the best person to be asking questions because you are very good at listening and you'll give people time to respond. And that's an important thing. So hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, last little llama tip. The best question may not be questions at all. Get good at listening. And um, yeah, thanks for having me today, Sarah. I've just been a great tug. I was so <laughs> inspired by Bose. I've been considering entering Iron Viz. My, my Tableau public is way behind in my actual skill set. So I've been too busy building for clients and not for myself. So, any questions? I know we're right at time, but I can hang on a couple extra minutes. Thank you so much. That was um, such a valuable presentation and, and just really made me re reflect on um, how, how I do things, how that, you know, how dashboards get made. And, um, and I definitely wrote down that um, you said this for a reason. I, <laughs> that might be one of my back pocket uh, questions slash phrases. So a um, lot of uh, thank you shout outs in the chat. Um, the um, for a question about questions, um, any advice for knowing when you need to ask more questions, collect additional information? Like, how do you um, get the timing of that? So I typically build it in, like when I, if I'm talking about like dashboard development, um, I, I actually have, uh, and, and we have some of these internally at, at Interworks that we share in that course where we use um, a software called FigJam. That's like a whiteboard software. And I'll even have those different categories, understand, define, develop, refine. And I make sure I touch back with my users during all of those phases. And because sometimes people will say what they think they need. And then after you've shown them like, well, here's the mock-up based on what you said. Here's how we connected the data. Um, is this all we need? And sometimes they're like, well, not really now. Now I need this. Or uh, this especially happens when people say, give me all the filters. And then they realize that's not what they need, right? Um, so as a developer, I'm always kind of thinking, I'm trying to listen to what people are saying is the outcome and then continually remind them of that because people can kind of jump from like big picture to in the weeds right away. And then they forget, well, what are we going to do with this when we're done? Right. So if I'm not getting the right answers that talk about the action from a dashboard or from a data visual, I always come back and revisit that. I was grabbing another post-it note to write that down. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, no problem. No problem. Well, sorry, I went a little bit over. Um, but yeah, I'll share the stack and I'll share. I've got that one pager that actually has some questions and little summaries kind of based on those question categories. Um, when I used to teach, I used to have like questions sticky noted to my computer. So I would just have them ready to go. But this one pager is a little bit more clean lined. You don't have to have sticky notes all over your desk. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much. <laughs> and awesome. um, I also grabbed the uh, resources you put in the Q&A and uh, that book title, too. So uh, we'll um, follow up uh, before next time. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So um, thanks, everyone, for, for hanging on with us. Um, uh, like I said, we'll uh, follow up with the uh, resources. Um, they'll, you'll also be um, email, emailed a survey for your feedback. We really appreciate your feedback. 
and the event recording will be on our YouTube channel, Data Pride Tug. Um, the sign up for our um, March meeting is up. Um, it's all about um, maps and Data Plus movies. We'll be joined by Dennis Cow and Kevin Wee. Um, and uh, that'll be March 21st, uh, two o'clock central time. If you scan the QR code, um, uh, that'll take you to the registration page. We'd uh, love to see you there. Um, so thank you so much for joining us um, and have a great day. Thanks everyone, have a good one.